I just wanted to say that I think this has been a really successful series, this, this college series, and um, next term it will also be, we'll be having some more talks, so stay tuned and we'll be telling you who's going to be talking. Right now I'd like to introduce Jeff Prue or have Jeff Prue introduce our speaker, Carolyn Aldwin. Jeff is a doctoral student in human development and family science who's been working with Carolyn. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Karen. As uh, Karen mentioned, my name is Jeff Brewer. I'm a PhD student in human development and family sciences. And uh, can everyone hear me okay? I'm standing next to him because I've got the recorder on my belt, and so... We're, um, we're very close. <laughs> so um, I wanted to start today's uh, presentation with a little quote, a little bit of poetry. Though I look old, and yet I am strong and lusty. For in my youth I never did apply hot and rebellious liquors in my blood. Nor did not with unbashful forehead woo the means of weakness and debility. Therefore, my age is as lusty winter, frosty but kindly. This is an excerpt from Professor Carolyn Aldwin's latest book, uh, Health, Illness, and Optimal Aging, Biological and Psychosocial uh, Perspectives, um, along with Diane Gilmer. Mm -hmm. um, this book has just gone into press. And um, this is just the latest chapter in Carolyn Aldwin's rich career, which has been spent studying the developmental processes involved with aging. And in particular, she's looked at the effects of stress and coping on aging. Now, I chose that particular quote because it also highlights Carolyn Aldwin's approach to studying development. Not only is she a strict adherent to, um, to scientific rigor, but she also brings her own creativity and poetry into studying development which has given us an opportunity to relook at development in, um, in whole new different ways. And she's constantly urged us to move away from uh, more reductionist ways of looking at development and, in fact, inf be more informed by transactional relationships between variables, looking at how psychology and how biology and how social cultural um, variables influence each other and how these together change um, together. And it's because of that that we've been able to look at stress and coping in many different ways. And it also gives us a, a way of actually with the potential that stressful experiences could lead to more positive outcomes. Um, Carolyn received her BA in psychology from Clark University in Boston. She received her doctorate in the uh, adult development and aging program at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, she has served as a lecturer, guest faculty, and visiting scholar in the United States and in Europe in particular at the Max Planck Institute, as well as uh, Wolfson College, Oxford. Uh, she was a fellow of the Gerontological Association and of the American Psychological Association's Division 20, Adult Development and Aging, and Division 38, Health Psychology. And she is the past president of Adult Development and Aging, Division 20. Uh, she has served as editor and on editorial boards in several high-impact journals, including Psychology and Aging, the Journals of Gerontology, the Psychological uh, the Sciences section, and the Journal for Personality and Social Psychology. And she's the current editor of Research and Human Development. She is the author of five books and 40 different book chapters, as well as over 50 journal publications. Um, I'm never done being amazed about her commitment to university and to the department and her extreme amount of support she has for her students and her commitment to scientific um, study. Thank you. Yeah, and further ado. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. And, and I can't take credit for that poetry. It's actually Shakespeare from King Lear. Okay, um, But it's, it's very nice because there's one part where he talks about old age being sans tooth, sans memory, sans anything. And then he's got an also positive aging in there as well. So um, I like that quote very much. Um, I want to talk today. Uh, can, can everybody see that? Um, yes. Is that better? Too dark? Yeah, OK. Um, I want to talk today about changes in stress and health in later life. Um, this is a collaborative research, and I'll thank all my folks um, um, at the end. Um, but And I wanted to say, this is, we don't have all of these grants right now. It's just that I'm, I'm going to be reporting from data over the last 20 years. And so there's a bunch of different folks um, who supported this. Um, one of the reasons I study stress is because I really think it's a key to aging. And there are seats if people want to come 
Yeah, you all right? Please? Yeah? No? Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. It's, um, it's just somebody once, when I was like an associate professor, looked at my CV and said, you know, you're really all over the map, but everything has to do with stress, right? And stress is sort of the way that you can tie everything about aging together from cells to society. And, you know, we have a very strong um, biology of stress group here on campus, um, looking at genetics and epigenetics, um, looking at the cellular levels of stress, the um, uh, reactive uh, oxidating, um, uh, the ROSs and the heat shock proteins, which are ways that protect the cell against stress. It affects regulatory systems that underlie most of the diseases in late life, including neuroendocrine and immune. Obviously, it affects psychological health. Uh, your ability to function, your social roles, and there's lots of stuff on culture, and I almost had a slide on that, but I figured, okay, it's too much. Next time. All right. Um, and indeed, some biologists are now defining aging as the increasing inability to adapt to, to stress. Right? So stress is really a key in some surprising ways. Okay, so I, I just, for those of you who aren't psychologists, uh, I want to walk you through sort of the basic psychosocial stress model, uh, which is by Dick Lazarus that I studied with in grad school eons and eons ago. Okay, and from this, I mean, we, we can induce stress people in the laboratory, but it's not nearly as interesting as studying them in context. So um, in the psychosocial world, the stress appraisals is really key, and I don't have a pointer with me. Um, anyhow, the stress appraisals is really key, and stress is not a function of the either of individual or person factors or just contextual factors, but it really comes together in how people appraise stress, and how you stress stuff, how you appraise stress affects your coping strategies. Your coping strategies, but it's a recursive transactional model. So you might think, ah. This is easy. I'm going to ace this exam, right? And you get in and realize, aha, there's all this stuff about classes you missed. And so all of a sudden, you don't have the coping resources and your stress level goes up, right? And you could also look at your outcome and say, oops, that didn't work out the way I thought it was going to. Let me try something else. So this is a model that you have to look at unfold over time. Um, and the key really is appraisals, all right? So different people can and do appraise or see the same situation very differently. Um, primary appraisal refers to the type of problem. Is it a, um, a threat, something that's going to happen in the future? A challenge, something you're looking forward to, but it's a little scary? Um, or a harm or a loss, or is it just not a problem, right? Whereas secondary appraisal is, how stressful is it? Namely, do I have the resources to cope? Right? So it's not a matter of there's an objective stress out there. It's really whether or not you can achieve it. You have the resources to deal with it. Um, so for example, if you're a skydiver, right? this is a wonderful thing. It's a challenge. It's exciting. It's, it's great just Great fun to do. I'd love to do it. I haven't done it yet. My husband says I'm too clumsy and I kill myself. Um, but I still, one of my goals, right? Um, however, if you're put in a situation that you're not expecting, that you don't have the resources to deal with, it's pretty stressful, right? I love Photoshop, right? This is great. So what I want to address today <laughs> is two questions. The first is, how does stress change with age? Right? Do adults, older adults experience more or different kinds of stress? And then how does stress affect the aging process? And this, by the way, my necklace keeps... Oops, let's see if we need that. Okay, so this, um, this is a picture of Barack Obama when he first started president, and this is a picture of him currently. It's a little touched up, I think, um, to emphasize it. But nonetheless, being the president of the United States is one of the most stressful jobs you can have. It's got the highest mortality rate of any position, mainly because of assassinations, right? Um, <laughs> But uh, it does. It actually does. If you look at the occupation and mortality, being U.S. president is right up there. All right. Um, and, um, but the question really does, does it accelerate the aging process? Okay. Whoops. No, 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 no. All right. Okay. Well, it depends. It always depends. It depends upon the type of stress measure that you're looking at, or the type of stress you're looking at, how age appropriate is your measure, and there are, of course, individual differences. So, 
how do you measure psychosocial stress? All right. One, the, is one way and the most sort of maybe objective in some ways is trauma. It's looking at serious life-threatening stressors, often with a rapid onset, and may involve collective threats, such as combat or natural disasters. Um, Sandy is a really good example. Katrina... Um, being plunked down in Afghanistan, you know, um, there's lots of ways you can, but the biggest source of trauma in the U.S., by the way, is cars um, and being in a car accident. Um, but then there are life events, which are major events requiring substantial life change, like getting divorced, maybe changing jobs, getting fired, going to jail, all those other sorts of wonderful things that happen to people. Um, there's chronic stress, which are ongoing conditions such as caregiving, poverty, or being in a really difficult marriage or a really tough job, um, and like being an administrator, I think, yeah. And, um, and then there are daily stressors, your hassles, your intermittent problems. And we tend to think of these as minor, but sometimes they can be more major. And here's just a quick heuristic uh, looking at sort of minor to severe and short-term versus long-term. And traumas tend to be uh, severe but short-term, but they can lead to chronic role strain if you develop PTSD or something like that. Right? Uh, daily stressors tend to be short and rather minor. Uh, life events are serious, a little bit longer lasting. And chronic role strain can be sort of minor irritants to really serious problems like caregiving for an Alzheimer's, and, but it's of lasting duration. Um, so, but the item type also, measure, uh, also matters. So a really common assumption, especially when I was in graduate school, is that older people are more stressed than younger people. Right. If you look at the 1970 Encyclopedia of, of Psychology, it talks about aging and it says old people are uh, anxious, lonely, depressed, suicidal, demented, and generally not functional. Right. And, and it was seriously. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it when I when I read it. Um, and but Rabkin and Stroining back in 1975. Right. when they were looking at the standard life events measure, showed that older people report fewer stressful life events than younger people. What gives? Well, if you look at the items, it, it's most of the stressful life event measures really tap things that happen to young people, getting married, getting a job, getting fired, getting laid off, getting put in jail. It's mainly stuff that happens to younger folk. Right. So um, when I was a postdoc, I actually lived in a retirement community for a little bit, and I developed the Elder's Life Stress Inventory, which taps items that are more common in later life, such as institutionalization of parent or spouse, deaths, retirements. A lot of the stuff the folks are talking about involved other people, network stressors, daughter's divorce, son took on a huge mortgage in Southern California, right? Uh, losing your prized possessions due to a move. And when you ask um, folks these items, you don't get the big drop-off in stressful life events that you do with the other scales. So it's appropriate to middle-aged and older people. Um, and so when I, we first got this R01, the most recent version of it, one of the first things we did was to, to try to understand um, what the literature says on how does stress vary by age and cohort. And it varies by type of stress. So Norris and Sloan did a lot of really nice studies, cross-national studies, trying to figure out what's going on with trauma and aging, and found it's really cohort. Basically, it's whatever cohort was in a war reports the most trauma, right? Um, and uh, well, life events are really more age effects in type rather than level, but a little bit of decrease with age. Um, Daily stressors very consistently find that older adults report fewer hassles than young adults. And this doesn't make any sense, right? Um, because it especially goes down to midlife and keeps going. And it doesn't accord with what we think life should be like, right? When you're in midlife, you're, you've got all sorts of um, challenges. You're usually senior in your field. You've got a lot of responsibilities. You've got caregiving for parents. You've got caregiving for teens. Um, so how is it that hassles decrease? And there are some studies that um, don't show that, but, but most of them do. Uh, nobody's looked at whether or not chronic role strain changes with age, which is a huge gap in the literature I would encourage someone to do. And even more surprising is that there are very, very few longitudinal studies of stress. 
and even fewer in which people look at individual differences in trajectories. It, it, you almost never want to ask, how does X change with age, at least not in the psychosocial field, because there's always huge individual differences. Right? How, well, how, what changes for whom and how much is what you really need to ask. And that's what we did in the first study. Um, and we published this last year um, uh, as part of a special issue on longevity. Um, so I'm also interested in how stress impacts health. And if you look at stress in animals, it's really clearly linked to mortality. Um, animals are very, very responsive to stress. There, I remember one time in, uh, I was in Massachusetts and everybody said, oh, we can't hunt the deer, we just need to move them. 90% of the deer moved, died of the stress of being transported, all right? Uh, in pigs, there's a porcine stress syndrome where 10% of pigs being shipped to market will die from stress. Uh, there was a great example, the Berlin Zoo was doing a Wagner festival, um, and they had, you know, the ride of the Valkyries, and the Okapi just keeled over and died, you know, from being so <laughs> frightened from this music. And, and you can take mice and, like, stress them on turntables, and if they're susceptible to breast cancer, genetically susceptible, they'll, they'll, they'll get breast cancer and die. I mean, they're, they're very, especially laboratory animals, are very susceptible to stress. But studies examining mortality in people yield mixed results. So the early studies, there's a whole slew of early studies showing, oh, yes, stressful life events, you know, leads to mortality in humans. But if you take out the health-related stressful life events, all of a sudden there's no relationship or there's a little bit of relationship, or there's no relationship, or there's actually a positive relationship where being stressed is protected. So, um, but as I said, nobody has longitudinal data. And I was fortunate enough, I started working with the normative aging study in 1985, so we've got data for the past 20 some odd years. And so on the uh, purpose of that particular study was to look at longitudinal patterns of change in stress with age and to contrast two theories of mortality. Um, a lot of you know about um, McEwen's allostatic load theory. It's very popular. Basically, the more stress, the worse, and the more chronic the stress, uh, the more its impact on health. And um, the other is my favorite, though, which is um, from biogerontology on hormesis, which says that a little bit of stress is actually protective because it activates um, stress protection mechanisms at the cellular level. So you could take a flatworm and expose them to non-lethal doses of heat, let them rest, and then expose them to lethal do what should be lethal doses of heat, and the pre-exposed flatworms uh, will survive, right? And the non-exposed flatworms don't. And you can show this. People have been exposed to a little bit of radioactivity, actually live longer, uh, there's been a host of studies, and there's even now whole, whole journals on hormesis. So the question is, is a little bit of stress in people protective as well? Okay. So as I said, um, we've been working with a normative aging study, uh, which actually started in the mid-1960s with a panel of almost uh, 2280 men who were screened for good health and social ties, and they ranged in age at that point from like 21 to 81. So, But they were all screened for good health. Um, we instituted, I got to the NES in 1985 as part of this retirement grant, so we instituted the social survey, um, which is 85, 88, and 91. And then in 1989, I got them powers that be to hook up the stress measures with the biomedical exams so that we, we have more concurrent data. And, so, and, and we get great response rates. I mean, the NAS men are just wonderful. We get over 80% on our surveys for the health and social behaviors, which they're given at the time of the exam or right before it. They get 95% um, response rates. And so this particular sample is, is uh, 1443 guys who completed at least three assessments between 85 and 2002. Um, with an average age of about 60. Mortality samples are a little longer because of missing data in some of our covariates. This is the age distribution of the NAS men in 1985. So you can see it's really a middle-aged sample um, at that point. I'm following people from midlife to late life. And as I mentioned, we're using the elders' life stress inventory, and we can score it in two ways, a total score or omitting the health items. Um, so this study is reporting on over 7,600 questionnaires that the NES guys uh, filled out 
um, over 16 years, I think. And we had the usual covariates, and mortality is um, assessed by death certificates and then coded ICD-9. Um, now, the interesting thing about stress is that, especially stressful life events, is that they are not normally distributed, right? Any sample has about 30% of the people say they didn't have any major problems in the past year. Not bad, right? But that means that analysis gets a little tricky. You can't use standard parametric stuff. Um, so for those of you who know about this stuff, um, I don't pretend to, but by my postdocs and colleagues know all about this, um, that we use a semi-parametric growth mixture model, right, to, to, to identify classes of trajectories, and we had to modify it for a zero inflated Poisson. As you saw, you know, a whole lot of the folks had no, um, no stressors whatsoever, and so these are the equations that we use to, um, uh, put people into classes. All right. So, when you look at um, just the no health items, <sighs> I was going to tell people to turn off their cell phones, and I should have. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, what you find is is basically three classes, and the random effects around both the intercepts and the slopes are significant here. And there's a little bit of a nonlinear trend. Um, I'm just wondering if I brought my pointer. No, I didn't. OK. Um, and so what you find is that some people start off with a whole lot of stressful life events when we graphed it against age, all right, um, centering age at the beginning of, of the period. And what you find is that some people have a really rough midlife and things get better, but they're still higher. And then the middle group, which is pretty stable in the lower group, which decreases a little bit. But when you look at, when you add back in the health items, you get this really interesting other class of folks um, who have a peak in health items, must be around age 70. Right? So you get these really interesting uh, nonlinear trends in change in stress over time. And... Um, these do indeed predict mortality. So if you just look at the sort of raw proportional hazards model, we find that um, both the moderate and the high stress groups have 40 to 50 percent higher mortality rates than the low stress group. Okay, I was looking for the nice little nonlinear effect. Didn't quite get the one I was expecting. All right, and this holds when you control for the usual suspects. All right. So um, people who have better health ratings um, live longer. People who are married live longer. People who do not drink don't live as long. It's a standard finding in the gerontological literature. And but what happens now is you do get a little bit of the nonlinear effect, where um, the moderate stress group is slightly higher than the high stress group. Um, but I wouldn't uh, think that it was significantly different. All right. So in summary, in that study, so that, so that longitudinal changes in stressful life events do predict mortality. So single-shot designs, where you simply measure life events at one point in time and wait 10 or 20 years, don't predict mortality. You need to understand the dynamics of stressful life events over the life course to understand how they're going to affect mortality. And the interesting thing was that neither the allostatic load or the hormesis model was fully supported. Instead, we got this interesting asymptote. Um, where it looks like, you know, anything over like three stressful life events a year for over a sustained period of time is going to increase your mortality and theoretically then accelerate your aging. Um, and, but one of the reviewers of the, of our article suggested that our hormesis group actually may have been our low stress group because they still had one or two stresses a year. So maybe the hormesis model is being supportive, but we just don't know of anybody who has absolutely no stress. I mean, it doesn't exist, right? So the question still remains whether or not low stress is protective or high stress is a vulnerability, probably both. Okay, any questions? Yeah? It is interesting that your, the fourth group that emerged in the second graph mm -hmm. had a zero in the 50 to 55. You know, it was lower, it has a lower intercept. It has a lower intercept. Some of that may be, um, 
You have to sort of tie yourself into absolute knots to right. get the semi-parametric, especially the zip inflated, and we had to check with, with um, Nagin back in UNC. And so, so when you get these things, sometimes they distort the endpoints. So I wouldn't put too much credence in it. Um, the overall shape of the curve is, I think, more important. What about the people who were uh, always zero? Like, did there, was there any relationship between them? <laughs> you know, we went, there's only like 30 of them or something like that. There aren't very many people. Um, but we need to go back and, and, and look. But I think, and frankly, I don't believe it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because that's the other thing you have to worry about when you're doing psychosocial stress is that some people, oh, everything is wonderful, right? And, um, and, and it's really not. And so, you know, I think there's nobody who has no stress. Okay. Now... Um, the question becomes, as I said, you get different patterns depending upon how you measure stress. So this is a study that we're currently working on. Um, I was hoping to submit it in the next couple of days, actually, and this is something we presented at APA um, in August. And so we're now looking at hassles and uplifts. Right? Now, so as I said before, the cross-sectional studies in general show decreases in hassles with age, but some show no effect and some show increases. Right? And again, how is it that older people that we know have physical disabilities or functional limitations have fewer hassles? doesn't make any sense. There are no long-term studies of hassles that we could find anywhere. Um, we have a rather unique data sets, and there, there are not even any cross-sectional studies, or hardly any, looking at uplifts in aging. Right? So, so my graduate students are tearing their hair and saying, well, how are we going to do this? There's nobody who's, who's written anything about this, you know. Uh, so how are we going to have an introduction? And I said, well, let's draw on the affect and aging literature, right? Because remember that whole thing about appraisal. It's not just what happens, but how you appraise it, right? So, and certainly long-term patterns of affect are probably linked to how you appraise stressors. So we said, let's draw on the affect literature. And there you find three different models, right? There is, my, my favorite is the hedonic treadmill. Right, it's a wonderful term. Uh, Janet Bullman and other folks, uh, uh, Diener and a bunch of people have talked about the fact that, in general, people's affect over the long term is fairly stable. And even um, Diener has done studies of people who win the lottery, right? Like the Powerball lottery, just win a couple hundred million dollars, and usually, right, really happy, right? And it lasts for maybe six or eight months, and then after a year, you go back to your original level. Matter of fact, some people get really stressed out and get very unhappy um, because all their relatives they never knew they had came out of the woodwork, right? Um, but in, in general, so the hedonic treadmill theory says that actually people's affect is pretty stable. And the, the more recent modified version, Dean said, okay, maybe if something really, really bad happens to you, you can change the set point. But for the most pe part, people are stable. So that's no development. But the developmental theories um, have mixed hypotheses. So Laura Carsonson says, oh, po has the positivity bias, that older people report more positive affect with age. They tend to appraise things as less stressful. And um, so and she provides a study showing either no change or an increase in positive affect with age. Baltus, on the other hand, says, no, 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 no. Fourth age is terrible time of life, right? It's really, really difficult. So the people who are old, old, over 80, they have a really tough time, and their negative affect goes up. And if you look at the Berlin Longitudinal Study of Aging cover, it's got some very, very grumpy old people on it. Um, and so these are in contrast. So does posit so Carson says is saying positive affect is going up with age, and Baltus says no, in late life, negative affect goes up. The problem with just looking at straight affect, of course, is that it doesn't tell you what's going on in people's lives. Right? And there is one study that I liked very much that showed age-related changes in, in or decreases in, in positive affect. Uh, and when you controlled out uh, functional health, the age-related change is different. So if you just look at affect without knowing what else is going on in people's lives, um, that it doesn't tell you very much. And so the, the, I think that in some ways understanding hassles and uplifts sort of daily stressors and, and nice things that happen to people and how people deal with them is a much better understanding of what's going on with affect in later life. Okay, so again, we return to the NAS, and these are folks who 
completed at least one assessment of the houses on uplift scale from 89 to 2004, um, and the mean age in 89 was 63. Um, the houses on uplift scale, um, you basically have a stem and you code it on one side for hassles, how much of a hassle on a zero to four measure, or zero to three, or how much of an uplift the same thing was. So you can have your marriage, your job, you know, your kids, um, the weather, air pollution, you know, you name it, it's on this scale. And um, what we did was we scored it two different ways. Uh, well, three different ways, actually. We scored it for intensity, which is the people's appraisal ratings, for just those items experienced. And so we averaged. For just the items that people experienced, we averaged their intensity scores. And then we also did a simple count of the number of items they reported to get an exposure. All right. And we also did the, then the summary, but I'm not going to report about that today because I'm, I'm not going to have time to do that. And so this is um, almost 4,000 observations and 1,300 men. Okay. Uh, and we could use multi-level modeling to examine the overall trajectories um, and growth mixture modeling to examine classes. The exposure scores um, were, um, we had to zip them as well. Okay. So if you look just at overall scores, what you find is that hassles decreases from age 50 to age 85. Right. So simply, this is looking um, at the um, exposure. So the number of items people report decreases. And it makes a certain amount of sense if you think of what happens to people's social roles in later life. They, people are no longer working, right? Their kids are grown out of the house, right? They, um, you know, you have fewer social roles, and so you have fewer hassles, right? Um, however, um, uplifts shows a different trajectory. Uplifts keeps increasing until age 65 and then decreases. Again, probably as a function of social roles. Right? Um, and, but the important thing to note is that uplifts, there's always uh, more uplifts than hassles in the NES men's life, which I think is, is nice. Right? Now, if you look at intensity ratings, you get different trajectories. Right? So, it looks like for hassle intensity ratings that Baltus is right, right? So, because it decreases a little bit, but then after the age of 75, it goes up. But you know something? Laura is also right because positive affect, the, the uplift intensity ratings, increases until age 70 and then um, levels off. So there's a difference between exposure versus how you appraise what's going on to you. And they show different developmental trajectories, which I think is, is pretty cool. Um, now, this is the growth mixture model, and this is why some people hate growth mixture models. Right? This is exposure. And what you find is that it's all over the map. Right? So these classes, are, they all range from like 4% to, to the biggest one is, I think, 17%. And so how many hassles and uplifts you're exposed to really depends upon your social circumstances, right? So it's sort of a life course model, right? So what's going on in your immediate social context is going to expose you to more hassles and uplifts, and it's not really related to age, or at least there are so many individual differences that it might as well not be, all right? And, but, here's the intensity scores, all right? Now, so... Baltus here is still, so we have four groups on hassles, right? So low, medium, and high, and then this group, which is the changing group, and that's 70% of the, of the sample. So four negative affect, four hassles, ratings, appraisals. The developmental, Baltus's developmental theory holds that life gets a little bit better until you're 68 or so, 65, and then you're facing worse problems as you face functional disability and bereavement and things like that. But this, and you find four patterns which are similar in the uplifts, but this one change pattern is only 20% of the sample. 80% are stable. So remember the old hedonic treadmill, right? It looks like the hedonic treadmill works for positive affect, basically, if you're a happy person, you're going to keep being a happy person. And if you're a miserable person, 
God help you, you know. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, but there are some people who do change, but only a few, right? And so, in summary, on that study, um, that all th three theoretical models are partially supported, depending upon whether you looked at the positive or negative, and depending upon whether you looked at exposure or appraisals, right? So the hedonic treadmill was supported for uplifts, but not for hassles, right? The Carsonson was supported for uplifts, and the Baltus was supported for the hassles. So it's like an elephant. And everybody's got a little piece, and they've been arguing for years and years and years. And if you put them all together, you can see that they're arguing over ears versus tails versus feet, right? Um, now, what about houses of mortality? And um, so this will be really quick, then I'll open it up for questions. Um, all right. So basically, this is the same sample that you just saw, and this is a study that Eugen um, and the rest of the lab just presented at GSA, so this is hot off the press, and um, and I and I had to take her picture, so I couldn't put a nice little red. What we find is you take those four Hassel's intensity classes, right, and you put them in a proportional hazards model uh, with the reference being low stable, and what you find is that the medium stable doesn't make any difference. The medium nonlinear increases mortality uh, risk by about eighty percent, but the high stable the people who were really sort of miserable, um, their mortality is increased by 400%. Okay? Um, so if you look at that, so this is the high stable group, right? Um, and then this is the, the low stable group, this is the medium curve, and then this is the, medi oh, this is the medium curve, and that's the medium stable. Now, I'm not certain I would put too much... Um, emphasis on that, because this that group is really small. There's only like 15 people, and we know that estimates are really unstable when you have really small groups. But the medium change group also had an increase in mortality of about 80%, um, so which is, I think, very interesting. Um, but the uplist, by the way, has nothing to do with mortality. So being happy, unfortunately, is not going to make you live longer, but being miserable might make you live a little less. Okay, so in some general limitations, the NAS men is a wonderful sample, but they're really homogeneous. They're white males. We've got blue collar and um, white collar folks, but we don't have really poor folks. We don't have really wealthy folks. We don't have women that we're trying to get the wives more involved, and we don't have very many minorities. So I don't know, you know, you know, how many folks this was generalized to. It was representative of the Boston population back in the sort of 50s and 60s, but, you know, that's 50 years ago, and life has changed a lot. And growth mixture modeling is still somewhat controversial, but I think what, what this pattern of research is showing is that longitudinal stress data are simply much better predictors of mortality than one-shot measures, um, and that chronic or increasing stress increases mortality risk. So... If you want to ask, does stress affect the aging process, you betcha, right? Okay. And this is Bush when he was first elected and then leaving office eight years later. All right. And I want to thank all the folks in my lab, um, Ron Spiro in Boston and Rick Levinson here, and then our postdocs, Eugen Jung and Louina Lee and Heidi and Jeff and Britwick. Thank you so much. I think we have time for a few questions. Yeah? That's okay. What about hassles and uplifts within the person on the same day? I mean, you know, they're not happening independently of one another. So what are your thoughts on the correlations or how they might offset one another when experiencing the same <laughs> It would be very interesting. Um, Zoutra, some people like Zoutra have argued that, up, that uplifts um, buffer the effects of stress. Uh, and we haven't looked, I mean, this is like hot off the press, so we haven't looked at that yet, but that's a good suggestion to do that. I'd love to know. Um, Eugene, do you remember what the correlation is? No, but the correlation in the hassles and uplifts. Okay. So, and also, we try to uh, have uh, an uplift when you look at the mortality and the hassle and mortality relationship, and uplift didn't do anything. So, yeah. that's why we try to try to uplift and then have a certain amount of hassle. But what we
we could do is to look at their interaction, right? And and that would be very interesting to see if, um, say, high uplifts. And we do have a little bit of that um, um, in in some data I didn't show you. We we're looking at at the how the categories cross over, and there are some there are a few people who have like really hassled no uplifts, and some people who are high hassles and high uplifts. And so we could look and see what combinations do, which I think would be very interesting. Yeah, because it could be that someone who often has a high level of uplift, but then they experience a hazard, a hassle, and maybe they know how to cope with it well, but mm -hmm. maybe they don't because they haven't developed the skills, you know, to deal with the hassle on a daily basis. And there's some work showing that there's an interaction in SES status and hassles, such that the folks who, I think you've mentioned this also, yeah, so the folks who are high, who are higher SES report more hassles, but we haven't looked at the SES. We haven't looked at the interaction. As I said, this is like hot off the press. This is like stuff we were doing. I think Eugene did these analyses the week before uh, the last set on the mortality, like the week before GSA. So, so we're still playing around with that with that paper. Yeah. Um, have you looked at, or if there's are there data to look at the types of support that people have actually buffered some of the some of the hassles, as well as um, if it's, say, unwanted support. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That might diminish the uplift. We, we have data um, that I collected in, as part of the social surveys where we have hassles data in a different format from the hassle scale, and we have all this social support. Who did you talk to, and how did it help, and did it hurt? And that data has never been analyzed, right? And it's like, uh, you know, we'll have, to we'll have to talk about that, yeah. Um, so we have a lot of social support data, and, and clearly the marital status, you know, is protective in the NAS men, so it's likely. Um, and I've, I've taken a peek at that data, and, um, and there's a very few people who, says, uh, who say that support hurt, but when it does, you know, they're really distressed. So, yeah, it would be interesting to see that. We uh, we do not have good measures of physical activity in the NES, unfortunately. We've got BMI, um, and which is not a great measure, but yeah. Um, but no, we would love to. I mean, the the book that we're just coming out with the, the second edition I mentioned. I mean, what we did was we went through all the different organ systems and tried to figure out normal impaired and optimal aging and, and what promotes optimal aging. And it was exercise for every single organ system and, and regulatory system. You know, so we all know about muscles and lungs and hearts, but, you know, stomachs and, and endocrine system and immune system. And so exercise was really sort of the fountain of youth. But, and I wish that the NES men had better measures on that. Yeah? yeah? Any other questions? Sure. Were religious preferences accounted for? Not in this study, but we do have this. The NAS men are, by and large, not very religious folks. We, we have some measures of that, and they tend not to do a lot. So if you look that the measures of religion affect health more for women and more for um, more diverse groups than they do for white males that tend to have very low rates um, of religiosity. Um, but no, I, yeah, we, we have other studies going on religiosity and health going on in different samples, but we, we don't find anything in this sample. Okay, good question. Okay, anything else? All right, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> <laughs>